afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. My name is Kyle Morris. I am the Vice President of Business Development here at NMR Events. And I am so grateful to have all of you joining us, whether live or watching this on demand. We really appreciate you taking the time out to, to join us and to learn a little bit about uh, event technology, uh, event uh, equipment, event planning, producing, uh, content creation. We're, we're really here today to help bring uh, some event professionals with insights, uh, different points of view, maybe even a little uh, futurist uh, uh, forward looking onto what we see coming up. But again, thank you so much for joining us. Now, today you are actually joining us on the uh, NMR Events Stream It platform. First up, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a, a very good, uh, two very good friends of mine, uh, Dana Ellis and Tess Vismal. Uh, Dana and Tess, welcome to the broadcast. So happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to be here. Great, great. And so, so just to tell you a little bit about uh, the three of us, between the three of us, you probably have about six, over 60 years of experience uh, in the events industry, and we've been involved with all different areas of it. Uh, Dana on the planning and, and, and show calling and producing side, while uh, Tess is an incredible uh, you know, event technologist, which we can talk about more uh, uh, in, in the near future. But guys, what I'd first like to do is, is take a look at how are we doing on that poll? Let's see. So the first poll I, I, we have opened up all right, on the platform uh, is to uh, tell us who you are, tell us your job title. So I'm gonna go in and do that myself right now, and I'm gonna put in biz dev, and this is gonna output a word cloud for us. Um, and I'm gonna send that in. And I see we have a bunch of people already been responding to that. Um, and we'll, we'll output that, uh, there you go. Yeah, so the word cloud is starting to form, and these are all the different uh, people that have responded on there. All right, and, and we, can, we can move forward from there. And we're gonna have another poll that we wanna put up in just a moment. Um, and, and that's for the next poll that we, we're going to ask you about is uh, is going to be directly related to the future events you have coming up. But we'll do that in just a few minutes. Guys, let's go back to uh, Dana and, and, uh, and Tess and, and start some of the conversation about the landscape of the event industry right now. Um, I'd really first love to go to, to Tess. And Tess, if you could tell me, uh, you know, what, what do you see happening right now? Uh, in our event industry over the next few years in events what what do you see is going to be the landscape for us um oh everyone calls it a metaverse right uh for some reason they yeah. they come up with cool terms just because right so um i see right. people probably do not agree with me um but i really do see kyle an emergence uh voice and voice activated ai um, and the ability to be able to deliver content um, in an audio manner. Um, just as an example, uh, for those who may not have experience with voice, you really truly have had experience with voice. You've had it with Alexa, you've had it with Hey Google, um, and then you kind of go down to, well, people have heard something called Clubhouse, right? But that can be used for events, but then think about content that can be, that the audio quality is good enough so that someone can actually be walking, running, jogging, and still receive content from you. And then also look at an option where uh, a bot can be reading your bio as an intro for you where you really didn't have to have a human being. So delivering content in a way in which people can self-select. So if I had a passport in my hand, I can pretty much choose how I'd like that content to be able to be delivered to me. And I also think more regional and local events and diving deep into delivering uh, events from a local perspective and fueling those ecosystems is truly going to be the future because that breeds collaboration as well. So that's that's incredible. You know, very interesting perspective. I always um, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm paying a, a you know I've been I've been paying attention to AI for a long time. I do believe that it will play a very significant role uh, in the events industry moving forward. Uh, as we continue to learn more about, uh, you know, data, how data is stored, how it is used effectively on strategizing what our events say and do and, and how they create engagement. But I love your take on audio as well. Uh, I'm, I'm a big audio book person. Um, you know, I understand the power of having access to audio wherever you are, because you can't, you don't, can't always look at something, but most times you can listen, right? Um, and I think that that's an incredibly important thing for us to look at with, you know, 
how content comes out of events, how it gets into events, and where it's utilized. But use, using AI-generated audio for different tasks and roles uh, is incredibly uh, interesting thought that I hadn't thought about yet when it comes to AI. So thanks for sharing that. That's that's really great, Dana. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw the same thing at you. Um, you know, knowing our audience has some event planners, it has uh, producers in the audience and, and things like that. I'm going to challenge you to answer this instead of on the technology side, like Tess is going to do, but from the planner side and 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 the logistical side of of this, where do you see events going heading? You know, how does it how does it roll out from what we've learned in the last 19 months to where we're going back into in person, and, and what does that all mean? Right. So I. I would say, first of all, I think that, you know, in-person events are are back, they're coming back, but hybrid is here to stay. I don't think hybrid is going anywhere anytime in the near future. I think it's something that most companies are going to incorporate into their plan for the foreseeable future. Um, I think there will be a continued emphasis on safety. And uh, like Tess was mentioning, the sort of technology enhanced interaction is going to continue to be a trend uh, into the future. So I think um, the other thing is we're going to see, uh, as tr uh, as Tess mentioned, the, um, the uh, use of events as a PR tool, as well as um, those kind of micro level events. So a lot of smaller events throughout the year rather than one big thing throughout the year. And that's kind of what you're going to see. That's again, you know, I, I think I'm 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 right in line with you on that. Um, I do have a few other things I would add on to that myself personally, just to give a, a rounded perspective. And, and then I think you you nailed it with saying that you know uh, the, the PR of events and and how that's utilized and and how people um, are going to be able to really take what we learn from events and roll that into funnel and roll that into you know all of the extra stuff that's going on. Um, uh, with with getting data into an actionable item post event, uh, but but for me, when I start thinking about how do I do an event uh, an in person event now versus how I would have handled it, you know, uh, two, 20 months ago, it is completely different, right? What I've learned in in the pandemic uh, has changed the way I think about events as a whole. Now, let me speak by saying. You know, we've been doing hybrid events for, you know, a really long time. Uh, I know we're going to talk about this in a, a little bit later as well, but, you know, adding a webcast to an in-person event is not new, right? However, right. we're better than that, right? We're better than just simulcasting out from our event now to this remote audience, uh, you know, a, a regurgitation or just a, a mirror image of what everybody's experiencing, like almost like, hey, look what you're missing by not being here in person. Right? We've, we've learned, we've evolved as, as event people. Um, and now we start to think about how do I bring that remote audience into my in-person event or create a unique experience for them that doesn't make them feel like they're in the cheap seats. Right? So I think that that's going to continue to be the challenge. And I'd love to dive into that more with you two uh, as we go through this. But before we do, let me just, let, let's go and can we go back to our, our, our slide results again? I just want to... Uh, look at this poll results and share them with the audience because uh, it wasn't a, a ton, but I mean, independent planners seem to be a very popular couple of presidents and CEOs, obviously, um, as we see our word cloud forming there uh, and, and giving some information that lets us learn from who our audience is. I would like to go to the next poll. So let's go ahead and take this down um, and, and let's go and ask people about, uh, you know, from our audience, what are the what are the events that you have going forward and how many of these events will have a virtual or hybrid component to them um so we're going to put that next poll active in just a minute uh, as soon as as soon as uh, we can have that go live it will uh, and and we'll move on to some other questions into our next section so this next section what we're going to be talking about is kind of tailing off of where we see the event industry going and what is the future of, of hybrid and virtual events for us all right, we, we, we all know the power of in-person. We've been doing it a long time. Nobody says in-person is going away. It, you know, it, 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 there's no way to, to, to defeat the power of people being next to each other, enjoying building relationships, having a dinner, having a cocktail, educating each other, giving each other a high five when they feel motivated, right? Those things cannot be replaced. 
However, what we've learned out of the pandemic is that not everybody can be there. And there are lots of people that want to that still deserve to be a part of those events and can learn from them and can, and can contribute and can add value to the event from their homes and their home offices. So I, I'll tee that up, right? And I will come back over to my notes, which keep popping down on me to ask my next well, question. Um, but my well, next question before you is just, for both of you. Can I just right? comment on uh, that real quick? Oh, sure, I Dana, think, sorry. I just want to comment on what you just said before you get to your next question, in that I think you know over the last couple of years, we found that in the virtual world, we have been able to collect more data on events, and, and that has been a benefit of virtual. They, uh, I think people have in general found that there's been a better reach. They've reached people who wouldn't have come in the past to a to an in-person event. And that has been, I think, an eye-opener for a lot of people. So now, as we're going back to live events, it's really about how to still connect with those people who may never come back to a, a live event for, you know, um, and also the hybrid gives them sort of a disaster proof where it gives them, you know, they're hedging their bets. So if you're planning something six months or a year from now, we don't know what's going to happen. It's much easier to pivot back to all virtual if you need to, if you already have it in your plan. Right. So yeah. I think yeah. that yeah. that's, yeah. that's why I think hybrid's here to stay. And, and, and Dana, you know, I'm going to interrupt right there because you, you, you know, my philosophy yeah. is all around percentages, you know, percentages, 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 mm -hmm. which means we're never ever should ever think about our world as virtual and in person and real life separately. We're always going to be hybrid if you're doing it right. It should just be a percentage of. So if I do 90% in person, a little 10%, uh, virtual that creates a hybrid situation right there. And if you're not thinking about it that way, I think that you're missing the mark and you have shut a lot of people out and you're not being inclusive in delivering content. A hundred percent. That's so you guys, uh, thanks for stopping me there. I, I, I wasn't planning on moving past it, but thank you for, for doing what you did because it, it really does, I think, start to round out this conversation naturally on what people need to hear. Right. Um, it's not, and, and it's not a battle of either or, right? It's it's really about what, what you guys have both been sharing. It's how do we do things better in the future, right? We've learned so much. Um, so let's let's start with this question for the, for this next section, and, and then we'll open up Q and A for these for this specific section. Is how do you see events in you know in person events utilizing what we have learned and executing vital uh, virtual and hybrid? Now I know you started to touch on that a little bit, but um, Okay, we got poll results up. Okay, <laughs> so um, what what we see coming through on the poll right now uh, is uh, what percentage of your upcoming uh, in person events have been uh, have a, a virtual hybrid component. So uh, it looks like you know uh, for the large part, between a quarter and half of them seem to be what are going to have a, uh, a you know. And I'd love to drill into that a little bit more too. But you got to ask the question in a single way. You know, of those answering, are you talking about an event or a trade show, right? First, because I feel like there will be a much larger percentage of virtual and hybrid components to conferences and 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 the the educational learning and the general sessions than there will obviously for a booth, right? Um, but but that's interesting data to look at. Um, so more more than half, right? Are you know, I think that's a strong percentage uh, that. This poll is indicating from the people voting right now that th that these things are sticking around, right? So let's go back to our question now, and and I'll throw this to to Dana first. Dana, with what we've learned, right? What are we going to do better at, at the in-person events? What you know, I know you started to get into this, but please tee it up and take your full thought on this. What does what do we add going into our in-person events with virtual and hybrid? Why is it a plus? Well. I think what's going to be important is that you have somebody on your team in terms of your AV production partners uh, so that the planners have a good team around them that preferably have a live event experience and virtual event experience because they are a little bit different. You have to think about both of them. You have to plan for both of them. And ideally, you would like people on your team that have gained experience at least over the last two years on how to do virtual, but hopefully came from a live and can then help you with both. 
and help you manage both of them so you don't have two separate teams, but really a combined effort to make sure that both your in-person audience and your at-home audience is getting uh, an excellent experience because both of their experiences are going to be different, right? So you, you really have to put some thought and effort into it in advance so that both audiences have a good experience. Yeah. And I'm sure Tess could probably I, I love, you know, add, add to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I test the same question to you before I throw it to you 100%. I, I just want to add to what Dana said. We love, I know I personally love, when I'm asked by our partners and everybody involved with an event, I love the idea of creating a very unique experience for the remote audience. And I don't think it has to bust the budget to do so, right? And we're going to talk budgets next. Um, but I think that you can very easily, even if it's, think of it this way, and I'll throw this one concept out there if you guys can, can get it for free right here. Create, create a desk inside the ballroom, all the way in the back, couple of people at a desk, right? They've got their backs to the stage, right? And they are commentating almost like you would see at a, a national convention during politics, right? Like they are, they're, they're your personal guide to the event, to the remote audience, and they are curating your comments, your feedback, and piping that to the stage, right? So, so when, when there needs to be that engagement level and that connection between the remote and virtual audience, um, there is a conduit in place to allow that fact to happen and to allow it to happen in a really well-polished way. Uh, Tess, I throw it to you. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. So, um, you know, I'm a tennis girl, so I mean, it, it's just correspondence. We know, we know television, we've known television for years, right? They're correspondents who are covering the sport, right? It's talking about the sport, play by play by play. And they're talking to the virtual audience. We have no issue watching television, right? Right. No issue. Why, right. why do we have an issue with virtual events? So you, it is an addition to your staff, per se, or or it could just be looking at your staff differently and rising up some skill sets that are already among your your wonderful staff already to put someone in that position. If you don't have the budget to hire out um, for that person. So you don't always have to have a host just for the stage. You can have a separate person who's actually just catered to um your remote audience or your uh, audience that's, that's actually going to uh, be joining you digitally. You know, I call it a virtual concierge. They can do anything and everything behind the scenes and also in front of the camera. So you want to kind of think about that. And uh, the rise of the roles that need to be played can be different and people can sit in seats differently. Uh, brilliant. Um, I think that I'll, I'll continue to add there with you, you know, um, when you start thinking about how do you connect everything, right, from a technology standpoint, I know that NMR, our thought is, is starting to evolve as we continue to look at the landscape on what does an in-person look like from a platform perspective, an in-person event, right? And so I'm starting to toss around the idea with, with, with all of my partners internally here, my colleagues, the power of having a single platform, right? that can deliver content anywhere on site, right? Can report data from every single attendee because they have a web-based app on their smartphone as an in-person attendee, right? Not something they have to download, right? Not a, a high friction entry point, something that's low friction. They scan a QR code and it takes them to a website or they type in the URL themselves, right? And now we have uh, an incredible insight into the data gleaned from the in-person attendee is the same platform that the remote attendee is using, right? As well as all of the interactives that are being used in the hallways of the event, right? Now we're starting to build this product that from printing the badge, right? To, um, you, know, uh, you know, playing a game, right? Uh, a leaderboard, an informational scavenger hunt, uh, an affinity tie-in to a, a, a not-for-profit organization can all evolve in this architecture that allows for events to be this truly far reaching, intimate at the same time experience without making it have this huge learning curve on how to do it, using the tools that people just know how to use now. So as I continue to look down the road and be a futurist in some aspects, that's really a lot of what I'm seeing. Um, and I know that there are a lot of new roles that came out of 
the pandemic and that I mean the last 20 months and, and what we had to deal with in the pandemic with being remote and uh, we're going to talk about that in a second and before we do I do want to first just give all of our attendees a kind of a look on how what's happening today what they're watching is happening right so guys in the studio if you don't mind if we can go ahead and bring up camera seven live I was actually in this master control suite at the NMR New Jersey facility yesterday um, this is one of our master control suites that we built where we literally took our building that had offices and, and gutted it and, and built from the ground up these rooms that are designed and engineered to bring in people remotely from all over the world. We have done events with, you know, multiple locations where we're doing hybrid, right, to having, uh, you know, completely virtual audiences and completely virtual presenters to a mix of local audiences and local presenters at multiple regional locations. This master control suite ties that all together and our team is absolutely incredible at it i just love showing these these guys i'd love to also show the experience that the three of us have today if, if you don't want you know we, we created a, a product a virtual green room that basically gives um everybody right uh the opportunity to look at you know what we see all on one screen right so if you look up right now this is actually the virtual green room Okay, and you can see we I have Tess and Dana there on the bottom, and uh, I'm up in the program right there, and I have the questions that are coming in. I see a question just came in on the Q and A module. It came up right there for me, so I can see that it just came in, and I can I can go to that question in just a few seconds. I have a speaker timer and the timer day. Uh, so that's the virtual green room that allows for our presenters to feel like they're you know right sitting next to each other having a conversation. Um, and I think this is a great time to throw out a question from the audience. Michael just asked a question. What do you, why do you think the registration data is so important within a virtual event? Well, I'll take it further. I think registration data is important, not only in virtual events, but in every kind of event. But I'm going to throw that out to Dana. I know Dana has uh, worked with us a lot and, and, and had her fair share of experience. And then Tess, I'm going to come over to you next on it. But Dana, why is registration data so important within a virtual event? I think data has always been important for events. And I think it's just been more, you get more data and more usable data from the virtual events than you necessarily might have collected in the live event space. So you've always had registration data, but now you can very easily see who arrived, where they went on the site, how long they stayed. Uh, you know, all of that, they, all of that information that really helps a company that uses the data that actually spends some time to to look at it and use it to find out where they're succeeding and where they could do better. And in person, they don't always track all of that information. They might know who arrived and who you know who showed up and who didn't, but they don't necessarily know who sat down in a meeting and stayed the whole time, who went to a breakout. You know they, they're not capturing all that data typically in real life some some do and some do it really well a lot of people don't so now they just have more data and in, in the corporate world especially uh you know that helps them uh show some you know roi it helps the meeting budgets uh know where they should be spending their money and where they could improve on things and so you know data is an important thing and i'm, I'm sure tess being the data queen that she is knows more about that than I do. <laughs> Who knows? That's what, what's your perspective on data? Oh, but yeah, <laughs> I, th I think, you know, and I say that the tech is what's going to allow you to get and drill down on the data points that you need. So you can dream of anything that you wanted to track in the world and do it. Even there's some that track how long the person actually literally looked and paid attention and was actively engaged in your particular session. You can drill all the way down, not the fact that they came in, they opened it up, right? And they shut it back down, but what they were doing while they were there, it might sound a little spooky, but you can do that and depending on what tech you need uh, for it. So I, th I think uh, it's highly important, um, but m now we can do better at telling stories around our events and customizing our events. And going back to what I said about passports, you can now deliver a passport to an attendee to say, okay, I want it this way, this way, and this way. Oh, you did it exactly like I wanted it done based on how I actually uh, move and navigate it through the events that you chose to plan for me. So 
I think it's very, very important to have the registration. Yeah, I, and, and to, to kind of put a cap on, on what the two of you just shared, um, you know, for Michael's question is why is it so, so important within a virtual event? Um, it data, clean data, right, and, and accurate data will always be the, the lifeline of any event, right? Uh, and in, in a virtual event, obviously, it gets amplified even more. Um, but to, to kind of bounce off of what Dana and, and Tess just shared, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a big magnifying glass on data. You know, we're able to measure everything, right? Um, and, and, and if we, we get into that one platform idea of moving into in-person events, we'll really be able to measure holistically what's happening, who's engaging with who. The real, the real the power in data is in the reporting. And more often than not, we see that a, a lot of our partners go into an event and they're so overwhelmed with just the up the uphill learning curve mm -hmm. of virtual and what it was and now now hybrid and then now mixing all of it together, right? Um, that they they don't have time to meet with their internal groups, their marketing team, their sales team to find out how that data needs to be reported out to to, to be effective and to be acted on. There's three areas that you want to look at with data. You want to look at you know, obviously what Dana shared, the ROI for the events team, right? Like, so everybody was there. These are the people that were there. These are who we reached, right? That kind of stuff for internal validation of the expenditure for the event, right? But then to, to compound with that, you want to really dive into the sales information, right? So how do you feed the funnel, okay? How do you take that, like what Tess was sharing about knowing how long somebody was engaged, what content worked, what didn't, right? We have great tools that work for, you know, for how to really learn about what content resonated with your audience or even which part of your audience. All of that data though, really needs a team in itself designed just to be able to make it effective. But the, the what I challenge everybody on this, this, this uh, conference uh, in this connect session about is take time to come meet with us and talk to us about how to take data seriously and how to make it part of your plan post event to lead to the next events that you do and to really make you even better at what, what you do for both the third division, third part being marketing, right? So how does your message change? How did your message resonate with the last event? Did it come across? Was it received? And how does that change your message for future events? So those are the three areas, right? Internally sales and marketing, those are the three big buckets of data that you really need to fine tune on. With that, I know we're, we're, we're getting uh, long in the tooth on section two. So let's move into section three, talking about the new roles. Um, I will start off with my dear friend, Tess, who is an event technologist. I don't, look, event technologists existed pre-pandemic, but they became the lifeline of events, in my opinion, during the pandemic and during the, the spring up in need of virtual solutions. Tess, tell me all about it. Why, what is it? Why do people need it? And why should they hire them into their companies? Well, uh, thanks, uh, Kyle. To keep it short, sweet, and to the point, which you really can't with an event technologist, is it's the person on your team. Uh, hopefully, you either have um, elevated the person to a level in which they are recognized for the work that they've been doing all this time and pulling your tech stacks together to look at what you have in-house, no matter how small or large, right? And bridging the gap between departments. So it's not someone who should be living in IT at all because IT knows nothing about events. IT is just IT, right? It doesn't need to be living just solely in the marketing department if your events department is separate from marketing. Some events departments are kind of technically event marketing departments and they're together, but if they're separate, they're separate. So it's someone who works and advocates for the event who can negotiate with the, your tech providers, who can look at what all the requirements are, who can really look at some of the data that's coming out of the events and make recommendations if they if they need to. But it really is truly, uh, as someone said, it's a super person, a person who's a mind reader, who can kind of uh, predict what is needed, who can really look at what's needed. Now, Again, that can be a consultant, someone who comes in for a short period of time. Maybe they have a long-term uh, relationship with your organization and or with you, or it can be someone who's internal. And I am being an advocate and evangelist for event technologists because it is needed. Last week when I was at IMAX, I did a session for Smart Monday sponsored by MPI on that same subject. The 
room was packed and the room was technically outside and people are in the process of hiring or have hired in this specific role. And you'd be really, truly surprised about how now we're able to craft our industry and for future projections and be much more adept and ready to embrace technology. Finally. Yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, the event technologist is, is definitely somebody that I think sits in, in between you know, um, the the uh, technology partners, the AV partner, right? Um, the person that's executing an in-person event, bringing in all that equipment and being the liaison to the different departments in the company and being able to kind of, you know, be the, uh, the interpreter as well, right? Because, you know, event technologists are event people that know the big picture and the big goals of that event and understand how to translate that efficiently into the language of the executing operators, right? The, 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 you know, the video engineers, the audio engineers, the lighting designers, right? Like all those people need that, that person. And I know, you know, Tess, you do this at a lot of different levels. And I, I think we could have a whole hour conversation just about that role, but for the sake of today and introducing this NMR connect series to the public and getting it going, we're going to, we're going to cover a lot of topics. Um, and, and, and Dana, I, before we had a new question come in that we're going to cover in just a second, but I would like to throw, uh, one more uh, question out to you, Dana, because I know that event technologist was something that really got highlighted. What about other roles? Were there other roles that we found during the during the last 20 months that, that we think will carry into the future that maybe we didn't have prior? Well, I think that a lot of event producers or executive producers often fill that role of sort of that event technologist that have become experts in the technology and all of the different platforms and things that are available because you're really seeing a wide variety of, of things that are available now and more and more people trying to enter the field to uh, fill this need for, for virtual events. So I, I think that the sort of executive producer, meeting producer role uh, will continue to be an important role for people to either have internally or hire out. Uh, and just like you said, Kyle, that person becomes the interpreter between the stakeholders who have a vision of what they kind of want out of their meeting and the technical crew and the platform people so that they actually get what they want out of their meeting at the end of the day. So I think that will continue to be an important role. And um, I think the planners too have really upped their game in terms of learning a little bit more about technology over the past couple of years and, and, and had to, you know, they've all had to pivot over the last couple of years to include virtual in order to continue to do events the last couple of years. So I think planners will continue to expand their knowledge as well. And um, you'll just, I think, see a lot of event people continue to have to up their game. Yeah, so, that, you know, I, I, and I like the way you ended I also, that. I that also think on the tech company side, people. they've hired, I've seen a great bit of planners do what we call go to the dark side and begin to work yeah. for tech companies, right? So they're hiring yeah. internally planners <laughs> to be project managers for that particular mm -hmm. account because they realize that gap between their tech and understanding how to do an event. You'd be surprised some of the big boys, if you will, have huge staffs, acquired many companies over this period in time, and maybe one or two people in their entire staff really know events. Mm -hmm. so, right. so I think that, that those yeah. roles have really truly expanded. So Dana was correct, up their game, and some have, like I said, gone over to the dark side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I like the dark side. It's comfortable. <laughs> I um, like the dark but, side too. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I flip flops. Um, so. <laughs> that's that's such a, a great way to put it, though, from from both of you. You know, um, we had I I felt like you know after the big LED push in technology, right? Like so that we we had that huge world of where all of a sudden there was never a projector to be found again, right? And everything was LED everywhere from for our, our, our screens and our larger events and trade show floors were inundated. I felt like there was this moment right before the pandemic hit where innovation had really come to a very lethargic place, right? Um, everybody was so busy doing 
everything they were doing that the innovators out there were struggling to, to really come up with the new next thing or didn't have the motivation, okay, to get beyond what we were doing. Now, with that being said, I, that's a, talking about innovation in the event space and, and where there's, that's going to be covered in other NMR Connect series and we'll always bring the very latest and best and most exciting new technologies to you in these for you, you, you and your staff to learn from. But for today, uh, I really want to bring in some of the questions from our audience. Jason just asked the question, do you see clients still trying to cram too much content into a one-off event agenda rather than spend on continuous smaller regular events because of the cost of tech and production? Um, you, you know, everybody has a different perspective on events, Jason, right? Everybody has a different perspective on the value of said event with the audience. This is a very discretionary question in the sense that some organizations that I've personally worked with completely get the importance of reaching out to their audiences, whether internally or externally, right? For an outreach event or a training internal event. Uh, the cramming of too much into an event based on cost, I don't see that as much as, as I, you know, as I think that a lot of people just have a lot of politics of what has to be said and who gets to say it in an event. So that drives that a lot more. I do see an over cramming of content. I, I'll throw that to Tess and Dana on, on their perspectives really quickly. And we'll move to our last section talking about budgets as we start to run tight on time. I'll, I'll answer first and then I'll let Dana? Tess uh, yeah. answer as well. But I, I just said, I would just say that it's, it, you know, it depends on the audience, whether it's virtual or in person, because I think that in person, they have a longer attention span than they do when they're staring at their computer. So I think you have to think about the agenda for who your audience is. And I think that we saw this trend even before COVID, but there's much more of a trend towards more of a two-way conversation with people and an interaction with your audience and doing things interactively and not just speaking at people all the time. And that's why even online you see, you know, polls and leaderboards and gamification as you're trying to engage the audience so that they're not just sitting and listening all of the, all of the time. So it really comes down to thinking about your audience. What do you want them to walk away with? And are they in person or virtual? And for me, it's it's really spending the time and effort in advance to craft, you know, those messages for those audiences. All right. And Tess, what's your thoughts? Um, short, sweet, to the point, getting down to the nitty gritty. Mm. Yes, I totally agree, Jason. Yeah. It's too much. Everything is too much. We have too much comp competition out there for attention to content. Um, and if your content doesn't shift and change yeah. and is not designed around how your audience wants to receive it, you'll have a challenge and a problem. And the only thing you need to do is ask them what they want and how they want it and deliver it. Brilliant. I agree. I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, I look, I, I'm a content person, right? I love content, whether it's analog, digital, right? Like, you know, at a, over a steak dinner, over a glass of wine, it does content, you know, conversation is content. Content changes uh, the mindset of people. It influences, you know, we, it has, so, you know, it, it happens in so many different ways. It educates, it, it excites, right? These are all things that happen through content. That doesn't mean it all needs to happen all at once and it needs to be long and boring, <laughs> right? I mean, the advertising agency uh, industry fi figured that out, you know, 40 years ago, right? You know, that's why the 30 second and 15 second commercial exist, right? Why is, does our content need to be, you know, 10 hours long, right? Why did this conversation need to be an hour, right? I mean, maybe we need to rethink it. I, I know that what, what Ashley from our team is going to do on marketing is she's going to take this hour long and break it into, you know, 50, 10 second clips, right, of sound bites and use that for marketing material moving forward to promote, you know, the next event, right? So um, content is, is definitely something that people try to do way too much in this period of time. I don't know that, I, I guess there are, Jason, a lot of experiences where that happens, where it's, you know, hey, let's get it all done at once rather than have it go across and, um, but let's let's keep moving forward um, into our last section, which is budgets. All right, and I I see on my speaker timer I have 17 minutes left, and I, and I think that that's I think we're actually right on schedule. Um, so Dana, let me start with you. This is a big one, right? Uh, I, I've been hearing this over and over again from all of our partners. 
man, you know, it's so expensive to plan events now if we got to do in person and we got to do, you know, uh, in person and a, high, a, a hybrid or virtual component, right? Uh, man, it's like two different teams and two different budgets. And, uh, and, and yes, right? I'm going to start by answering the first part of this so you can go right at the, the, the crux of it. Yes, if you are doing two separate events and putting it at the same exact time, right? Uh, yes, there are going to be budget increases because you have two separate components going that are incredibly complicated in and right themselves. However, there are ways to put on an event that's both in person, has a virtual component, and is cost effective. But Dana, I'm going to let you answer this instead of me going through. I just don't want us to get into the, the, the hiccup of if I'm planning two things at the same time, why would I expect for them to cost the same as doing one, right? Like that's... That's silly, right. but Dana, take it away. It it definitely does add to your budget to do both, to do a hybrid event, but it does not have to break the bank. You can do very simply, you know, streaming your your general session, keeping it to one room and have a single page online to stream your event. You can keep it very cost effective. It's, you know, just adding a small amount to your budget can get you that part. Then from there, there's a lot of ways to add and, and you know, it can be a, a, a big giant increase to your budget if you want to add all kinds of pages online and all kinds of interaction and gamification and things like that. So it, it definitely runs the gamut from very, very simple to very, very complex. Um, and, and that's why you want to, you know, try to find a good partner that can really help you manage that for you uh, because you do have to put some thought and effort into it. But I think at the end of the day, it's really about your expectations and having a clear expectation of what you want to get out of that event, what you want your audience to walk away with, and uh, trying to figure that out in advance so that you can wrap your head around your content and your both in person and online and, and communicate that to your partners who are going to help you execute on, on that vision. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, Dana, when 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 I used to get asked a question by my my partners all the time, it's like, Kyle, what's the new cool thing that we can do at an event or a trade show? What's the greatest latest tech, right? I mean, it, it's it's the it's the age old question that comes downhill, right? It starts all the way to the buyer and it comes all the way through the either the agencies or the production companies, whoever we're working with, right? And and it's always the same thing for 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 me. I always said the same thing back. I was like, hey, and this applies, I think, to what you just said. Don't do it because it's cool. Right. So don't add all these right. extra features in just because they're available to you. Right. Do what works. Right. Spend your money and invest not in every feature, but the features that will work with your audience, that you have enough time to explain to your audience and to market to your audience ahead of time so that they can leverage them during the event. Why? What's the point of having a great you know, social media stream on your on your virtual or remote platform if you don't ever tell anybody about it and they never use it? Right. Or what's the point of doing we, a leaderboard see, if you don't publicize the matrix and the gaming and how to, you know, tie in a charity group to get people excited about participating? Go ahead, Dana. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I was going to just say we see that over and over again where they may have added a leaderboard or they added some sort of a game, but they didn't take the time to explain it or encourage people to participate in the event or in the game or in the leaderboard. And then it doesn't get, you know, uh, a lot of traction and then they question why they did it. So, but it really, it, you have to, that's why I say you have to plan for it and think about it. And you have to have your people who are on stage and, uh, uh, you know, online explaining it to people and inviting them to participate and asking them to participate and sometimes even giving a prize for participating. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kyle, can um, I, can and, I and Tess, Let me, let me come get your perspective on this, please. Oh, sure. So a couple things on budget. Um, your budget wouldn't be as big as it is if you didn't ask your audience what they want and design the experience around it. Sit down with your stakeholders, your core team first who knows events and have them come up with lists of what I want to have, what I need to have and the non-negotiable. Right. And then look at your mm -hmm. other stakeholders like your boss, your board and all of that. Do the same thing with them. Then come back 
And hopefully you've already asked your audience to that as well, in a sense, right? And then see what your needs to have are and what you can craft around that. And then extent, again, that goes back to what I've said about the role of a virtual event concierge, which is that should be the person who's as Kyle always says the adult in the room to teach you how to do the game. Yes, you've sent them the information ahead of time, but you know people don't read. You might even put it in video. They may not have had a time to watch it, but who is reinforcing those educational points throughout the event to make sure they tie it in? It doesn't have to be the host that's on screen who, or who's on stage the entire time who is making you all excited. It could be just an educational person who's making sure you understand the plan, whether it's an in-person component, whether it's a virtual component, or even a, a true hybrid component. And we know, Kyle, what a true hybrid is, is those audience need to communicate at some point in level. Amen. That is the truth, right? I mean, the battle over the word hybrid. <laughs> yeah. Um, but okay. but what you just said, Tess, is the purest definition of it, in my opinion, as well, right? Um, if if you are not allowing for those two audiences to have a communication point and they are not engaging with each other, you're just putting a webcast on and 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 having an event. You're not doing a hybrid event, right? Like hybrid is about those two audiences having that those engagement points, being able to communicate, um, and 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 having them understand how to do it from from the beginning and that starts with a rock solid communications plan okay um internal teams at organizations if you don't have the bandwidth rely on your agency these people know how to get people to open up emails right like they understand okay how to get people to click on the video right and if you're already overloaded and you don't take on more work right, to prove value because you're like, oh, we can do this internally. Spend the money on the agency to do it for you because the end result, the return is going to be astronomical. And this doesn't mean just hybrid or virtual or in person. This applies to everything, right? That communication plan is the lifeblood or the lifeline, rather, sorry, leading into your event for it to be successful. If you get people excited through communications, right, just imagine what's going to happen when they get on site looking for the things that they learn to do leading up to the event. I, that gets me excited, man. I, you know, I've seen it done incredibly well and I've seen it done very poorly. Uh, and, and then, you know, when post event, when we were doing like, well, why didn't this work and how did this not happen? Like, you know, well, let's, the, the technology was there, but why didn't people participate? And I know we've kind of talked about that a lot, but maybe that's a whole other conversation that the three of us need to have to help give our, our friends out there tips on, on what works and what doesn't. I know I have a few. Um, let me let me just uh, give you guys both an opportunity as we start to wrap up or final thoughts. If anybody has any more questions, please uh, shoot them into the, the Q&A. Um, but, but more importantly, uh, Dana, what are your closing thoughts looking at the future of our industry, uh, where we're headed, and what we need to plan for moving forward with our in-person events from a budget perspective and, and things of that nature? Well, just to go back to what I said at the beginning, I think that uh, hybrids are here to stay. I think that we are going to have to plan uh, for some additional costs in our budget for to accommodate both in-person and a hybrid component for not every event, but for a lot of our events that we're doing. And I think it's important to find those people that have that expertise in events uh, and in technology as Tess was saying earlier with the event technologist type of a role, the producer type of a role, people who have some expertise in events, have a plan, have a backup plan, and maybe even a backup to the backup plan. Because as we all know, you know, the, the virtual relies on internet. A lot of what you're doing in person relies on the facility that you're at and their internet and their capabilities. And so now we're we're adding in a lot of extra factors that can you know fit possible failure points, and so we all have to have an extra backup plan. So having people around you on your team that you hire that can easily uh, accommodate those problems and go to the backup plan quickly, so that your audience is not impacted negatively, I think will just be more important than it ever was. And, and you know, planners have always had a backup plan and produce, production companies have always had a backup plan, but now it's just more important. I think it's just elevated in importance. 
Thank you for those those insights and thoughts. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Dana, I, I'm going to give you the floor and, and allow you just, uh, I'm sorry, Tess, uh, just the Tess. only request I have, Tess, is that we got about six minutes and 30 seconds left. I, I'm asking for just a couple at the end because I know you got a lot to say. I love hearing it. I'm just asking for a couple from you. So six minutes, thank you, Fresh, I'm on. Is that what you just said? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to put it in a nutshell for you. Um, you want to invest in your people, whether it's internal or external. You need to either identify someone in your team who is an event technologist who can take that role, whether you're paying for them now or later, but you need to identify that. Um, and then you also need to say, I loved how Dana rolled out the risk plan that needs to be paid attention to, right? But when something fails, who is going to be in place to help fix it? But then also invest in a virtual event concierge person who can make the audience feel good while the event technologist is fixing it or working with the teams to fix it, right? The producer usually takes that role, but who is also being an advocate for your company as well? And I think as independent uh, planner professionals, which I am as well, uh, we need to think about how we're educating our clients to this, right? We need to bring to the table how they need to trim the fat. They need some slim fast on those budgets because there's fat in those <laughs> budgets in places where it shouldn't be. And then you need to shift yeah. those dollars to, to critical areas of where it should be. So those are my thoughts for that. And then for the future, again, voice, voice, voice is the future of events. That's that's brilliant. I love that. I, I think that's a perfect segue into kind of my final thoughts about where we're headed and, and what to look for and, and how for us to really create um, very unique experiences moving forward in, in, in our events coming up, whether they're in, uh, in person, virtual or, or a hybrid. Um, the first term that I, I, I'm trying to make famous because I think it will really help planners, producers, clients, buyers, everybody in the events industry think blended event schedule, right? Um, the challenges in front of you, all right, are going to be this, right? A lot of big companies conducted business in the pandemic, right, over the last 20 months, and, and life went on without being in person. Does that mean that in-person shouldn't exist? Absolutely not. We need in-person. We need that human-to-human -human connection face-to-face. -face. However, budgets, bottom lines, are always the, the dictators of what and how things are done. Okay, so uh, what we're going to need to look at is how do you accomplish everything you need to, right, for the outreach side of things, right? Um, that's the most powerful and important in-person event, in my opinion, right? However, team building in person is important too. Getting to see people, high five each other, right? This, so, so you need to find the right combination of what is a carbon footprint, uh, carbon footprint reducer, right? A budget, <laughs> a budget enhancer, meaning something that's going to leave room in the budget for those in -per big in-person events, right? So you have to find that right combination with your your schedule coming up. Come meet with us. We'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, you know, we'd love to, to to help look at the future of, of what you need to accomplish and how to get that done, for, for, you know, hybrid, in person, uh, and in virtual environments. When is the right time to use the right technology or plan the right event? That's a big deal, you know, and and it can be done incredibly well and very effectively where you're you're really maximizing your spend, uh, and that's what we would love to see happen. Um, with that being said, you know, at the same time, when you're planning a blended event schedule, you have to always be conscientious of the critical areas of your budget that need attention, as Tess, as my friend Tess just said. Let me, let me, uh, John, in the studio, if you could, can you just bring up our master control suite again? I just want to point something out about critical areas that most people don't think about. Um, John, John's going to bring up this, this master control suite. So now in this master control suite, right, when you think about redundancies and you think about your event living both, whether it's a hybrid or in person with a virtual component, right, you have all these things that need to take place. In that one room, you have a primary and secondary main streaming system, okay? You have primary, secondary backup graphics and playback machines, right, just like we do it in person in a master control suite. More importantly, in our building, we have primary and secondary internet providers, right? And then if the power goes out, we have all the equipment on battery backup, right? And then a generator that gets turned on in that 20 minute, 25 minute overlap where our batteries are running the equipment. You have to have a partner that thinks that way, right? 
you need to think that way when you're taking on these new hybrid and, and in-person events with virtual components to them. You have to have a partner tied into you, invested in success, not taking shortcuts. How do you plan your budget? Is it the is it the five hundred dollar pot of coffee, right? Or is it the event technologist who saved the whole show, right? I mean, think about that, right? It, we're we're in the human business. Our co greatest commodity is our people. We know that it's across the board in the events industry, right? Everybody can own the same equipment. They can own the they can rent out the same venue and the same conference facility, but they cannot replace the talent. The talent is the talent, and there's plenty of it. I encourage you to go give your, uh, your your event professional partners a big hug after this big pandemic experience we've all had. Get excited about the future. Uh, and, and Jason, all the way coming from Ireland, uh, thank you so much for your interactions. He's uh, he's, he's, he's uh, been, been sharing some of his questions and his thoughts. Uh, I, I encourage you to come back to the next one. To Dana and Tess, my guests today, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to invest in, in, in our partners, our friends, all of our colleagues out there in the event industry. Um, the last thing I will say to everybody watching as we wind down here, on the platform, you'll see at the top navigation, there is a button that says meeting room. I'm gonna be in there. I think Tess and, and, and Dana might join me for a few minutes as well. This is one of our, our, our breakout session rooms. Come talk to us in person uh, and, and, and we, can, we can chat one-on-one. -on -one. Key word that we learned, another key word that we learned is access. We want access, right? We want that to carry over into in-person events. We want to be able to have access to the knowledge, the people, and the things that help us really evolve ourselves. Uh, thank you very much. Again, my name is Kyle Morris. I'm the Vice President of Business Development here at NMR Events. Thank you for watching this NMR Connect series. Uh, we're going to continue to do these. Uh, we'll figure out the pace at which we do them, and, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day.